the slides up. Okay, so tonight we're going to discuss another one of Daniel's mysteries. And we're in the last chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. And I want to tell you that we didn't cover everything there is to know about the book of Daniel. Okay? So we kind of gave you just a brief overview of the book of Daniel, but there is so much more content that you can learn in this book. We didn't talk about the 1290-day uh, prophecy. We didn't talk about the 1335-year prophecy. We didn't talk uh, in very specific detail about the little horn power and how we would change times and laws. So there's a whole lot more things we can cover and study in the book of Daniel. But tonight, I'm going to complete the overview by sharing with you some information about Daniel chapter 12. So let's begin. Tonight's topic is called The End and a New Beginning. So a few years ago, an evangelist preaching in Budapest, Hungary, uh, sometime around the collapse of the Communist Party in that country, uh, was invited by a university president to speak to an audience of uh, university students about the Bible's evidence for the existence of God. And afterward, he would be followed up by an uh, astronomer who would try to prove from science that God does not exist. And so the evangelist decided to take him up on the challenge. And so he shows up, but there's one problem. You see, the evangelist was present, but the astronomer hadn't shown up. And so instead of being given one hour to show evidence from the Bible for the existence of God, the evangelist was given two hours. And so he talked about Bible prophecy. He talked about Babylon and Middle Persia. He talked about Greece and Rome. And then he talked about evidence from archaeology, which validates the Bible and shows that the Bible is accurate. He talked about design and how there's design in the universe, there's design in the human body, and there's design throughout history. He even talked about how all the sciences actually show evidence for the existence of God. And finally, at the end, he opened up the floor for, for questions. He had shown that there is a loving God, a creator God, who designed, who fashioned, and who put man together and created them with a meaning and a purpose. And when he opened it up for questions, a, a student said, well, we sent one of our cosmonauts into outer space, and he didn't see any God there. Therefore, God does not exist. Have you ever seen God? The evangelist decided to answer the man's questions with another question. He said, you're an atheist, right? That means you don't believe in God? Said, yeah, that's right. So the evangelist said, well, how much of the world's knowledge do you think you have? Do you have 100% of all the world's knowledge? Or how about 95%? Do you have 95% of all the world's knowledge, all there is to know about math and science and chemistry and astrophysics and language and art and history? Do you have all the world's knowledge, or at least 95% of all the world's knowledge? The student said, no. The evangelist said, well, professors, do your students, do you think your students have about 95% of all the world's knowledge? The professor said, no, they don't have that much. He said, all right, all right. How about 50%? Do you have at least 50% of all the world's knowledge, everything that there is to know about language and arts and civilization and uh, physics and math and so forth? I said, no. All right, he said, I'll grant you 5%. Do you have at least 5% of all the world's knowledge? The student said, sir, you're being too generous. We probably only have about 2% of all the world's knowledge. The evangelist said, 2%? 2%? That means that you don't have 95%, sorry, 98% of all the knowledge that exists in the world. So if you only have 2% of all the world's knowledge and you don't have 98%, then is it possible that in all the knowledge that you don't have, in that 98%, that God exists? The students reply, that's logical, sir. So the evangelist said to them, well, then you're not an atheist. You're an agnostic, because an atheist says that he's absolutely certain that God doesn't exist. But if you just can acknowledge that in 98% of the knowledge that you don't have, that it's possible for God to exist, then you're an agnostic. I have another question for you, said the same evangelist. Now, atheism says that there is no God, right? 
The student said, yeah. So the evangelist said, well, if there is no God, then that means that when you die, you go into the grave, and you're going into the dark, cold earth. You're just an animal. You go down there, and throw some dirt on you. You rot, you stink, and then you're done, and you're gone, and that's it. But Christianity says that there's a loving God who created you, who fashioned you, who made you with a meaning and with a purpose. And he sent Jesus. God sent Jesus to die for your sins and to have mercy on you so you can live with forever with him in the kingdom of heaven. And if you die before he comes, then he marks the spot where you're buried. And at the second coming of Jesus, Jesus will come down and come right to that spot and resurrect you and lift you up right out of the grave. And you will live with him forever and ever. And so, you've got two choices. The first choice is that you either go into the grave and the worms eat you and that's it. Or your second choice is that you die and your death is really only asleep until Jesus comes. And when he comes, he will resurrect you and take you to heaven with him where you'll live through all eternity. Now, of those two choices, which one would you rather have? The student said, well, I'd love to live in a new land forever. So the evangelist said, well, then you're not an agnostic either. Because an agnostic says, I don't care. You're a seeker because you're looking for a new land. And that's what I've come to share with you this evening. Amen. You see, the second coming of Christ is everything. What hope does atheism offer uh, a mother whose husband is dying of cancer? Come with me sometime to a cancer ward of any hospital and see someone who's going through radiation therapy or chemotherapy. What does atheism say to that? They've losing, they're losing weight, they're losing strength, losing hair, and losing hope. And what does atheism offer? Nothing. They say you're suffering, and you're just going to die, and then you're going into the dark, cold earth, and there's nothing else. Atheism doesn't give people hope. They say that the grave is just a dark hole in the ground, and it's a long night without a morning, and there's nothing beyond it. But the book of Daniel pulsates with hope. You see, the book of Daniel says that history is not circular. It doesn't go around and around and around. According to the book of Daniel, prophecy has a starting point. It starts with Babylon, and then it goes to Middle Persia, and then it goes to Greece, and then it goes to Rome. It goes to the collapse of the Roman Empire. It goes to the apostate church. And then it goes to the final judgment. And it ends with the climactic event, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so every prophecy in Daniel, no matter where it begins, ends with the second coming of Jesus. The return of our Lord and his descent from the clouds of heaven in power and great glory. So Daniel says that there's hope for our weary and war-torn world. Daniel says that there's hope for our confused and chaotic climate. Daniel says there is hope for our overpopulated and polluted planet. And Daniel says, let our hearts beat with that hope. The entire book of Daniel comes to a climax in the 12th chapter. So open your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. As we ended Daniel chapter 11 last night, in our last session, we talked about verses 11, sorry, verses 11, no, chapter 11, verse 44 and verse 45. So tonight we're going to start with those verses. We're going to start with 44 and 45, because verses 44 and 45 lead us right into Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. So let's begin with Daniel 11, verse 44, and it says, But news from the east and north shall trouble him. So news is coming from the eastern sky, because that's where Christ is coming from. Amen. And what about the north? That, the north is the site of God's throne. It's where God's law is, and where God's throne is, and where God's sanctuary and tabernacle are. And so the good news of Christ's coming, the call to accept Jesus and to obey him, troubles this antichrist power. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. So the Antichrist power then becomes furious, and he, he passes a death decree to stamp out and destroy and annihilate God's people. He shall plant the tents of his palace. What, what, that, what was that? Does anybody 
remember from last night? The tents of his palace. His sign, his mark, and his seal of allegiance. Where does he plant them? Between the seeds. What are the seeds? The people. And the glorious holy mountain. What was that? God's throne. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. The final verses of Daniel chapter 11 describe a fierce battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Satan focuses his attack on God's people. He is the great deceiver and the great destroyer. He deceives those whom he destroys and he destroys those whom he has deceived. And so although Satan will attempt to obscure the truth, he will be utterly defeated and Jesus and his people will be triumphant at last. Daniel 12, verse 1 says, At that time, Michael shall stand up. Now remember in chapter 10, we talked about who Michael is. We'll go back to that in a little bit. So in Revelation 12, 7, it says, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels. So we see here that Michael casts out Satan. On earth, in Jude chapter 9, it says this, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses. So we see here that Michael contends with the devil about the body of Moses. And it was Michael who resurrected Moses from the dead. So the word Michael means one who is like God. Michael is one of the names of Jesus Christ. So Michael is the commander-in-chief of all the angels. So he's the head of all these angels. Michael is the archangel he stand, who stands over and above, separate and distinct from the angels. He is not a created being. He is not an angel. So here in the last days of Earth's history, the final hours of Earth's history, the Bible says that Michael stands up. Now, was there ever a time when Michael sat down? Because it stands to reason that if Michael stands up, there must have been some point at which Michael was sitting down. Let's find out. We're going to read about it in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, his garments white as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. So here we see that Michael sits at the beginning of the judgment. And then in Daniel 12 and verse 1, the Bible says that Michael stands up at the end of the judgment. So first he sits and then he stands up at the end. So at the end of time, just before the coming of Jesus, there will be a cosmic and eternal judgment in heaven. Revealing that God is just, God is fair, and God is righteous in his dealings with humanity. God is just, fair, and righteous in how he has handled the controversy between good and evil. Have you ever wondered why people suffer as they do? Has that ever seemed to you? Have you ever wondered why it seems like righteousness always gets dragged in the dirt and evil seems to triumph? Well, in the final judgment, God is going to set all things right. God is going to set all things right in the judgment before a waiting world and a watching universe. He's going to decide the, the destinies of all of humanity. And so the Ancient of Days sat at the beginning of the judgment. In Daniel 7, verse 13, the Bible says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So the Father and Son both sit in the judgment. The destinies of the whole human race are decided at this point. 
So we studied the 2300-year prophecy the last time I spoke, right? And we talked about how it ended in 1844. Now, since 1844, we have been living in the eternal, we've been living in God's judgment hour. So, okay, so that began in 1844. So the destinies of the human race have been being decided in the courtroom of heaven. But in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says that Michael stands up. So the nations of earth have been judged and condemned in God's throne room. In God's throne room, it's been shown to the universe that God has extended mercy. God has extended justice. God has extended fairness. He's extended his compassion. So if anybody is lost, they are not lost because God has not been merciful. They are not lost because God has not been just or fair. They are not lost because God has not shown compassion. But they are lost because they have turned their backs on that mercy. They have spurned God's love. They have turned their backs on him. And so the judgment reveals that God has done everything he can to save humanity. But some people just will not go. Michael, the mighty warrior, the great prince, has been standing in that judgment for the people. So the purpose of the judgment is not to condemn God's people, because the Bible says that Michael is standing for them in the judgment. Okay, so if he's standing for them in the judgment, the purpose can't be to condemn God's people. But Satan accuses people before God and points out their mistakes. He says, I know that John Stone. He's a sinner. He's made mistakes. He's got shortcomings. He's got flaws. He's not perfect. He doesn't deserve to go to heaven. He doesn't deserve to live forever and ever. But Jesus steps forward and he says, that man, that woman, they gave their hearts to me. And so my blood covers them. They are covered by my righteousness. Yes, they've made mistakes. Yes, they've got shortcomings. Yes, they've got flaws. But my blood covers them. And what God's blood covers, Satan has no jurisdiction over. Amen. And so, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ is the Michael that stands up for me and you in the judgment. Amen. When a sinner is covered by the blood of Jesus, Satan has no jurisdiction over that life. And so at the end of time, after the final judgment, Michael stands up. And he looks down on earth and he sees the church state union. He sees people suffering. But he also sees those who have been loyal and faithful to him. He sees those who have tried to show his mercy to the world. He sees those who have tried to show his love and his grace to the world. He sees all that. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Every one was down written in the book. There will be a time of trouble. And Christ protects his people during the time of trouble. Now, there's a lot of theologians out there who say that God is going to whisk his people out of the earth, take them out of the earth, or rapture them out of the earth before the time of trouble. But that is a false theology. You see, throughout the Bible, God has shown that he always protects his people in times of trouble. He doesn't take them out of the earth before the time of trouble. For example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Were they delivered before or after they were thrown into the lion's den? They were delivered after. How about Daniel? Was Daniel delivered before or after being thrown into the lion's den. So that shows me that my God protects his people and brings them, he protects them during times of trouble, and then he brings them out after. And so when Nebuchadnezzar was looking inside the fiery furnace, and he was expecting to see three Hebrews burning, but instead he sees four people, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. And then you got the other king who comes to the, to the lion's den, and he, and he looks in and he says, Daniel, has your God been able to deliver you? And Daniel calls out, yes, my God has been able to deliver me. He has shut the lion's mouths. God delivers his people in times of trouble. Yes. And so we can even look back at Moses. And Moses goes to the Pharaoh and Moses says, God, give me a message for you, Pharaoh. God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. And so the plagues began to come down on the Egyptians. But I got a question for you. Were God's people in Egypt delivered before the plagues or after the plagues? After the plagues. And so the plagues began to come down on the Egyptian. And even when 
came to the last plague. The blood on the doorpost told the destroying angel to pass over the houses of the Israelites as it went to go visit the Egyptians. And God's people were protected during that time of trouble, during the plagues, and then they were delivered after. And so we see that God has a consistent track record, doesn't he? He protects his people in times of trouble, and he delivers them after. So here in Daniel chapter 12, the Bible talks about a time of trouble such as never was. And Daniel and Revelation have to be studied together. And so come with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. God's people will be protected during the plagues. God's people will find him a steadfast savior during times of trouble, during these plagues. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to start at verse 2. Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 2. So the first went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and, who, and those who had, sorry, and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it, came, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And in verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. So they had worshipped the beast, but now it has become Darkness. There's no light there. Verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. Verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out. So here we're seeing a spiritual revival that will take place. But this spiritual revival is not led by the Holy Spirit. This spiritual revival is led by the spirit of demons. Let's take a look at verse 14. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. In some translations it says miracles. So in the last days of earth's history, during the union of church and state, the devil will be working mighty miracles and signs. The sick will be healed through false miracles. Matthew 24 tells us that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 tells us, don't marvel at this because Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So the deceptions in the last days will be so great with all the healings and the miracles and the things going on that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. And so there will be false miracles and false healings and false uh, teachings and false prophets. And almost the whole world will be deceived. So that lets me know that I can't be impressed with many churches. I can't be impressed when I hear about people doing healings and different kinds of miracles. Why? Because the Bible says that these demons will have power to work signs and miracles in the last days. And that lets me know that it's up to me to put faith in God's word, not in miracles and signs and in wonders. And so, yes, God can work miracles. There's no doubt about that. God can heal. God can send prophets. God can do all kinds of things. But these miracles will not be worked by God. These will be done by the working of Satan. So there will be a final battle a great day of God Almighty, when Satan will attempt to stamp out God's people. But notice what it says during the sixth plague in verse 15. And by the way, I forgot to mention that Satan will even attempt to impersonate Jesus Christ. He'll say many of the same things that Jesus said. He'll do many of the same things that Jesus did. But it's not Jesus. So it's important for us to study our Bibles so that we'll know when it's really him coming. But listen to this. It says in, uh, uh, that during the sixth plague in verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments.
Does he walk naked and they see his shame? So, question. Is Christ coming before the six plagues or after the six plagues? He's coming after the six plagues. Why? Because the Bible says so. So just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saved and delivered after going into the fiery furnace, just as Daniel was delivered after going into the lion's den, in the last days of Earth's history, God's people will be delivered after living through the seven last plagues. They'll live through the time of trouble. So God will have a people who, when all around them they see disaster and chaos, when they see uh, catastrophe, when they see that their lives are being threatened, when er every earthly support is cut off, they'll still look to Jesus as their Savior. Amen. They will look beyond the plagues. They will look beyond the trials. They'll look beyond the heartaches, beyond the sorrows. They'll look beyond the Antichrist power. They'll look beyond the beasts. They'll look beyond the church-state union. And they'll look beyond all that and focus their attention on the second coming of Jesus. That will give them hope. That will give them encouragement. That will lift up their spirits, even in times of trouble. So let's turn again to Daniel chapter 12. Yes, there will be a time of trouble, but you and I will not be alone. See, we're not going to be figuring out and scratching our heads trying to figure out, oh man, how am I going to survive a time of trouble? How am I going to be able to bear this one? I already got so many problems in my life. No, 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 no. You see, God is with his people in times of trouble. And so Jesus is our deliverer in times of trouble. I want to share with you these two Bible promises. The first one is Psalm 91, verse 7 to 11. And the second is Psalm 32, verse 6 to 7. And I hope that these words give you encouragement. They weren't in the original slides, but I added them because I thought this would be meaningful to you. Listen to what it says. Psalm 91, verse 7 to 11. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near you. Amen. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the rewards of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Then there's Psalm 32, verse 6 to 7. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found, surely. In the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. So Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So he's been standing for us in the judgment. And he stands for us now at the end of time. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. So Christ stands watch over his people. Deliverance is on its way. Christ will return in the clouds of heaven gloriously the second time. And Matthew 24 describes exactly what this is going to be like. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. But I want you to keep your finger in Daniel chapter 12, because we're going to go back to it a little bit later. But we're going to go to Matthew 24 and verse 30. <laughs> Can you imagine? All around us, the earth is quaking and shaking. The seven last plagues have been poured out. The boils from head to toe are on the wicked. The rivers and thousands of waters have turned to blood. The sea has turned to blood. Commerce and industry has been interrupted. And the sun begins to scorch mankind. They have accepted false ideology. They have turned their backs on God and they look and they are scorched by the sun. Natural disasters take place. Crops are burned. The beast and the antichrist power, which they thought gave them light, 
are now sitting in darkness. The support system for the beast power, the rivers of people who supported it, are now dried up. There's conflict, the final battle, the mark of the beast is in force. Satan is about ready to pounce on and destroy God's people. And at that time, Michael stands up and he says, you know what? That's enough. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. A taxi driver is stuck in a traffic jam, and he looks up, and he sees this cloud in the sky, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter as it draws closer and closer. Other people can't help but notice it either. There's a sailor who's out at sea, and he looks up in the sky, and he sees the same cloud. Smaller at first, but then it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and then brighter and brighter as it comes closer to the earth. A husband calls his wife and he says, Honey, did you see the cloud everybody's talking about? Says, what cloud? The cloud everybody's talking about. Secretaries are talking about it. Business people are talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. And the cloud keeps coming closer and closer and brighter and brighter. And people start to realize, Hey, wait a minute. This is no ordinary cloud. There's something different about this cloud. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. See, this is the time of the end. These are the last days of earth's history. So we look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So these aren't ordinary clouds, but these are the flapping wings of angels. What they thought were clouds were actually the flapping wings of the angels as they were bringing Jesus back to the earth. And so we look up and we see Jesus coming, and now there's a new premonition among the wicked, those who have not accepted Christ, those who have spurned his mercy. There's a young businessman who's on his way to the top. He's got a nice suit, nice tie. He's got a great job, great salary, attaché case, jet series. He's got a boat and a yacht that he goes to on the weekend. And sometimes he goes snowboarding on his weekends. But then as this cloud comes closer, he's beginning to sense that he's put his priorities in the wrong place. He's beginning to sense that he is lost. You know, what difference does all the success make in the world if you're lost for all eternity? Do we have our priorities in the right place? Every wine glass begins to tremble in the hands of those who are drinking it now. The parties stop. The music stops. The stock market stops. The business deals stop. The earth is trembling and buildings are shaking. You know what's funny? All these things are stopping now, but they couldn't stop when it was time for these individuals to come to church. But anyway, the earth is trembling, the buildings are shaking, the sky is illuminating with the glory of God. And many women who don't know Christ are trembling in, in fear now. In fact, the Bible describes this in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and uh, I'm sorry, in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? He is the Lamb. He is Jesus Christ. The one whose hands have been outstretched on Calvary's cross. The one who, on whose head they put the, the crown of thorns. 
the one who they pierced his side. This is the Christ who loves. This is the Jesus who cares. This is the Jesus who wanted nothing more than to redeem men. But they didn't care. He cared, but they didn't. He reached out to them, but they spit in his face, and they spurned his mercy. The Christ that they rejected now has a glory that, and a brightness that's too great for them to look on. And so, rather than look at his face, rather than embrace his love, rather than rejoice in his presence, they're running now. They run and they run and they run. They hide, they run, and it's too late. You see, sin always runs from God. Just like in the Garden of Eden. What did Adam and Eve do once they sinned? They ran and they hid. But there's another group that Daniel talks about that does not run from the presence of God. This is found in Daniel chapter 12. There's another group, and this group doesn't run from his presence. This is the group that longs to see him come. This is the group that senses that something spectacular is about to happen. And this group senses that this is the last day on earth. Daniel 12, verse 1, the last part. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. So deliverance, my friends, is on its way. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. So here, a resurrection occurs. Now, somebody might wonder and say, why does it say here, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake? So keep your finger in Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to go to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Let's look at what he says. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So how many will come forth? All will come forth. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. So when Jesus comes, graves will be opened. And all who have accepted Christ will be raised up. Later, in a future Bible study, we'll talk about what happens in the resurrection of condemnation. So we're not going to focus on that right now. But this text just tells us that there are two resurrections. A resurrection of life and a resurrection of damnation. So back in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. What does this mean? Well, Revelation chapter 1 helps us put this whole picture together. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. So even those who pierce Jesus are going to see him come. Those wicked Romans who had nailed him to the cross and pierced his side will see Jesus coming when he comes again in power and in glory. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting condemnation. So there will be a special resurrection for those who persecuted Christ and those who put him on the cross. Can you imagine what that must be like? The last time they saw him, he was on the cross, but now they're seeing him coming in power and great glory. But they will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. That's the prediction here. But now, let's go back to the second coming of Christ, and let's talk about not the small group. I don't want to focus on the small group that gets resurrected, but I want to focus on the much larger group that gets resurrected. The ones that are raised to everlasting life. Amen. That's what I want to focus on. Amen. The book of Daniel climaxes with the resurrection of the righteous dead and the second coming of Jesus. Can you imagine it? Christ comes streaming down from the sky. Some can't look at his face, so they run to the mountains and the rocks and ask them to fall on them. But there are others who look up and they say, this, behold, this is our God. 
We have waited for him, and he will save us. Amen. Outside a tenement apartment in the ghetto is a young mother, and her arms are marked with the scars of her addiction. But her heart is scarred even more from the men who used her and who basically treated her body like a plaything, who left her broken and shattered. And in her arms is a six-month-old baby. But she looks up and she sees Jesus coming. Recently, she's accepted the Lord. She's given her life to Jesus Christ. And so her sins have been forgiven. And she has been transformed. And then she looks up and she sees Jesus. And she, and she says, this is my God. And she looks down at her child and she says, he's coming for us. Elsewhere, there's an elderly couple sitting on a park bench. A man puts his arm around his wife. They're feeble in their age now. He didn't have much hope at all. His body has been weakened, filled with pain from arthritis and rheumatism. The elderly couple looks up and they exclaim, Christ is coming! And in an instant, they are changed. We will all be changed in an instant. They are transformed, given new glorified bodies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. At some windswept cemetery in Kansas, a mom and dad uh, go hand in hand and put flowers on the grave of their 16-year-old son. He was killed by a drunk driver. And so they went to the grave site and they're ready to put the flowers down. But as that cloud comes closer and closer, an angel drops from the sky right to the grave and says, Little John, come up! And he pulls him right out of the grave and he is resurrected and joins his family, his mom and his dad, and they hold each other and they're embracing each other and they're crying. And then they're caught up together to meet Jesus in the air. And then the angel goes flying off to some other mom and some other dad. The grave opens and more are coming out. What a spectacular resurrection. Amen. 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 This is the last moment of Earth's history. This is the time of glory. The righteous are redeemed and they're caught up to meet Jesus in the sky. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. In these last days of Earth's history, God will make one final appeal to mankind. Daniel 12 and verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So this text is not so much speaking about scientific knowledge or knowledge of technology and things like that, but it's talking about the knowledge of God's word. So, men and women living in the end of time will have a special knowledge and a revealing of God's word and God's truth. So, these prophecies will be opened up and light will go to people of all ages and will shine in this final generation. God knows that the temptations of Satan are great. And so, in these last days, he has provided a means by which more knowledge, more light, more revelation will come to mankind. God knows the temptations of Satan and how he deceives. But this group of people in the last days of Earth's history will have an abundance of knowledge of the Word of God. Time is running out. The sands of the hourglass are soon gone, and hands of the clock are approaching midnight. Soon, we're going to look up and we're going to see Christ in the sky. Soon, the cloud is going to come closer and get brighter and brighter. Soon, we'll all be called up to meet Jesus in the air, or will be slain by the brightness of his coming. Either you're saved or you're lost. And so, God says, I love you. I want you to be saved. I want you to live forever and ever with me. And so he reveals his truth to you. It's no accident that you're here tonight. It's no accident that the Holy Spirit brought you here. Because God wants to tell you something. He's appealing to your heart right now. He's speaking to you. He wants you to know. He wants to give you his mercy. He wants to give you his grace. He wants to show you compassion. He offers you forgiveness of sins. 
and he wants you to be saved, and he wants you to know these are the last days. Time is running out. And so God is appealing to your heart right now. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. I want you to really listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. What is it that God brought you here for? What is it that God wants you to do? Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. And Sister Ruth is going to come forward and sing for you in just a moment. But as she does, I want you to think, I want you to contemplate in your heart. What is God saying to me? And I want you to ask yourself this question. What is more important to you? What makes you unwilling to surrender your life to Jesus? Are you going to be ready when Jesus comes? Ruth is going to come forward and sing to you. And afterwards, I'm going to come back and I'm going to make one final appeal. But I want you to think about these things in your heart. And I want you to ask yourself what God is revealing to you that he wants you to do right now.
Christ has changed my life. And I know he can change yours too. And so I want to make a final appeal tonight because God wants to change your life. He may need you to make some changes in your life, whether it be drugs or alcohol, whether it be lust in your heart, whether it be whatever it is. Jesus is speaking to you right now. And so I want to ask you, what is keeping you for making a decision for Christ. I'm going to make three appeals tonight. And the first one, this is not for church members. The first one is for someone who may never have known Jesus before. And you want to be baptized. Maybe you've heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, and you hear, you hear him saying to you, it's time. It's time to make your decision. And so if that's your desire, I invite you to come up, and I want to pray with you. Is there anyone here who Here's the voice of the Holy Spirit that's telling them that they need to be baptized. Anyone? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Not me, but the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you and letting you know that you need to be baptized. My second appeal is for those who have already been baptized. But you realize that you've never heard of these type of truths before. You realize that God is revealing so much more light to you. You've already been baptized through immersion. And now you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you and letting you know that you want to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I invite you to indicate that on the card that you were given. And my final appeal. Maybe you heard something tonight that you've never heard before. And now, you want to know more. You want to join a Bible study. You want to learn more about these truths. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. I'm asking you to indicate that on your card. Check off. I want Bible study. And if it's not written there, you can just write it on the back. Looking for Bible study. I invite you all to stand with me and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the truths of your word in the book of Daniel. And we, th we thank you, Father, for letting us know that these are the last days of Earth's history. Help us, Father, to let nothing come in our way from serving you and from giving our lives and our hearts to, to you. We thank you, Father, for being the God that wants to occupy the throne of our hearts. Amen. And so we ask you, Lord, to be here with us and help us, Lord, to make a decision for you. We pray, Father, that you would touch our lives and change us, Lord, for the better. And help us, Lord, to live for you. Grant everyone traveling mercies as they travel home. And we pray, Lord, that these truths would resonate in their hearts. Because, Father, we don't know. We're not promised tomorrow. And so, Lord, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice will make their calling and election sure today. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.